Good evening, everyone. Welcome, friends. This is our first, not our first, this is our public lecture, Caltech Astronomy public lecture for the month of August. And I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'll be your host for this evening. Uh, we've got a really good program tonight, uh, a talk that's all about the formation of the elements in supernovae and other kind of dramatic explosive events that's going to be given by one of our star postdocs in the department. So uh, just as a quick layout of this evening, it'll be uh, about five or 10 minutes of announcements by me. I'll introduce our speaker, Andrew Emmerich, for this evening. He'll give a talk for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll launch directly into a Q&A session. But it won't just be Andrew answering questions. It'll be an entire panel of four of us. So Andrew, myself, and then Dr. Ilaria Cayazzo, who's a postdoc in the department, and, and uh, PhD candidate Sarah Blunt, who works on exoplanet stuff. So we'll have a, a wide kind of expert pedigree to be able to discuss various different astrophysical or space science or just general physics questions that you may have. And that'll go until about nine o'clock. So these events, we've been, we've been doing these events for about four years, mostly in person. Only in the last few months have we moved online, but all of our lectures for the last four years are available online on our YouTube channel. So if you, if this is your first time viewing this, definitely check that out. We also have a, a sister series that happens once a month called Astronomy on Tap. That is, tends to take place in a bar, but obviously we've moved that online as well since the, the quarantine. And you can see those are recorded on, online as well. But they, uh, our next one of those is a week from this coming Monday on the 17th. And I, I'm still configuring the speakers, but it's probably going to be on the first stars in the universe and perhaps gravitational wave stuff. So it should be really cool. Um, other announcements. Well, so typically these events have a stargazing component, but obviously that isn't really possible uh, right now. So but there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in the skies right now. So I just wanted to give people a heads up on what's going on. There's a really cool piece of software called Stellarium. I've shown it before here. It's a sky visualization tool. And let's see, you guys should be able to, should be able to see that. So this is what the sky looks like. Well, this is kind of a weird version of what the sky looks like. From here in Pasadena, California, Los Angeles area right now at about seven o'clock, but we can arbitrarily move forward in time and see what the sky looks like. So this is in the northern part of the sky, the southern part, and so on and so forth. And you can see very prominently Jupiter and Saturn are visible um, over the course of most of the night, but certainly after sunset, you'll see it, what looks like a very bright star in the, in the uh, eastern sky, southeastern sky, and it's actually Jupiter. So if you were to look with binoculars, or a, a telescope, you could actually make out the disk of Jupiter and see uh, the four Galilean moons, the, the largest of Jupiter's moons that are orbiting around it. They look like little, four little stars that are in a line, which is kind of cool. Uh, similarly, right next to Jupiter is another what looks like bright star. But again, if you were to zoom in, you would see that it is in fact Saturn. And you can, even with binoculars, you can make out that Saturn doesn't look like a circle. It, it looks like it has ears, which are actually the rings. So we'll zoom back out here. Obviously, if you are in a dark enough sky site, you should be able to see uh, the Milky Way, but probably not here in Pasadena or even in the San Gabriel Mountains to the north of us. But if you progress through the, through the evening, so that's at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, the moon rises with it, Mars rises. So another planet that's visible to the to the naked eye. And over the course of the night, Venus eventually rises at about four in the morning, and Mercury comes up just about half an hour before sunrise. So it gets kind of lost. But but if you're up at dawn, you should be able to see Mercury just above the horizon before the sun rises. So that's really cool. Um, in addition, hopefully many of you were able to see Comet Neowise in the last couple of weeks. It was the brightest uh, comet that we've had visit the solar system in the last, or the inner solar system in the last 20 or so years. You could see it naked eye uh, under the right conditions. But even if you weren't able to, it's still possible to see it with some sort of aid, either a small telescope or a large telescope. 
or binoculars. You just have to know where to look and 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 be in a pretty dark sky site. So certainly not from here in Pasadena or in Los, Los Angeles, but up in the mountains or in, in a national park would be very good. And I've included a, a link in the description for this that points to a web page that describes how to be able to find Comet Neowise. But the other really big player in the night sky right now are the Perseid meteor shower. It's going on right now. Um, it usually extends for several weeks, but it peaks over the course of a couple of days, and that will be next week. Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning will be the best time to see the meteor shower. So meteor shower is, is a bunch of shooting stars that are all happening you know, pretty frequently. For this one, it'll be about 50 per hour. So it's not like, boo, boo, boo. it's more like, boo, and then you wait a minute or two minutes and then you see, it doesn't, it also doesn't make that noise. It doesn't go, boo. but uh, you should be able to, if again, in a dark sky site, uh, this is all naked eye. You wouldn't want to have any kind of telescope or, or aid for this because you want to see as much of the sky as possible. So choose a uh, part of the sky, uh, choose a location if you want to go see the Perseids that's a dark sky location, and nominally where you can see the constellation of Perseus. Now the constellation of Perseus is up in the early morning. Uh, we can see it, let's see, it's gonna show up. Ah, aha. So this allows us to kind of cheat and find, find uh, constellations. Let's see, where is, ah, here's Perseus in the northeastern part of the sky in the, in the, you know, after midnight or so, and it rises higher and higher over the course of the, the morning before dawn. So it's kind of happening, if you know where uh, the double cluster is, it's happening kind of between Cassiopeia and Perseus, right in this vicinity, you should be able to see it. In fact, with Stellarium, you can click on this, ah, click on this and it shows where the Perseids are actually happening. So what you want to do is find a location where you can kind of find that kind of uh, view on the sky. One thing that may help, there are a bunch of apps for your phone called like Sky Guide or Star Walk. Usually they cost a few bucks, like three bucks or something, but then you can use them and, and it'll show you what you're looking at. It'll be like, oh, that's where Perseus is. Or you can search uh, within it and, and hold it on the sky and it'll show you where stuff is. So it's really useful. And then Try and just sit there like with a, on, a, on a blanket or a chair or a towel and just look up in the sky and don't play around on your phone because that'll mess up your, your night vision or any, any kind of light sources. Just allow your, your eyes to adjust and be able to see what's up in the sky and hopefully you'll see some, some shooting stars, some, some, some meteors. It's, it's a fun experience and, and the Perseids are always a favorite because they always happen in August when it's nice and warm outside so you don't, aren't worrying about having to bundle up and, and be cranky because you're staying out too late in the cold, cold sky. So uh, yeah, I guess those are the major announcements that I had for you. So now I would like to invite Andrew. Andrew, do you want to join? August when it's nice and warm outside. Hello. Hey, Andrew. Um, okay, so Andrew, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrew Emmerich is a postdoctoral researcher in theoretical astrophysics at both Caltech as well as the Carnegie Observatories. Those are the observatories that run the Mount Wilson Telescope and where Edwin Hubble was employed a century ago. Uh, broadly, he's interested in galaxy formation and evolution and focuses primarily on studying how stars enrich galaxies with new elements over cosmic time, much like he's gonna talk about tonight. Uh, to do this, he produces simulations run on high performance supercomputers to evolve galaxies and their stars over cosmic time. Outside of astronomy though, he can't spend enough time rock climbing or trail running, a man after my own heart, and hiking with his wife and 11 month, 11 month old son, James. And we have a link to his website in the, in the description. In addition, I'd like to point out two things. One, it's Andrew's birthday today. He turns 29, which is super exciting because uh, who does these things on their birthday? That's super awesome. So thank you, Andrew, for that. And I also want to point out that Andrew is my academic little brother. We both had the same advisor in graduate school, uh, but I was several years in front of him. And now it's really exciting to have him back at the same institution as me here at Caltech. So I'm really happy to 
to introduce Andrew. Andrew, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, oh, yeah. And that's a super sweet space shirt that you have. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Uh, let's see. Looks good. That looks great. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Cool. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Cameron, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here uh, on a Friday night. And uh, clearly, I know you're all here to celebrate my birthday rather than here uh, for the talk. But you know, I appreciate it uh, as well. So what I, what I wanted to talk to you about today is sort of something that I, that I do uh, for my own research a bit and something I'm, I'm interested in. And that's really talking about uh, the origin of the elements. And I say explosive origin of the elements, just because as you'll you know, gain appreciation throughout this talk, uh, you know, all of the elements that we know of uh, in the universe, all the elements that make life possible, all the elements that make the universe the way it is, uh, originated in some way, uh, in some form uh, through a star. And those elements uh, came to be where they are in the universe today uh, through some sort of uh, explosive or energetic process with these stars. Um, you could see that a bit with this nice little uh, uh, GIF running in the background. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, again, this is a really interesting question because it really does get at the core of, of you know, how do we come to exist today? Because you know, when the universe was first formed, uh, there were two elements. And I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but there was hydrogen and then there was helium and that was it. And so everything that makes life possible and everything that makes, again, the universe the way it is today uh, came through stars. And so, you know, what elements am I talking about? So for elements that make up life, uh, this pie chart shows uh, sort of graphically the, the you know, wh which elements uh, uh, are responsible for life. So oxygen, for example, uh, we are mostly oxygen uh, by element, uh, also carbon and hydrogen, nitrogen, and a handful of other things like calcium, phosphorus, other like little minerals that sort of make our uh, body actually work. Um, and those are just a subset of the elements that are present uh, in the Earth. And so if we look at the same graph for the Earth's crust, for example, uh, that's again, mostly oxygen, um, and then a lot of silicon, aluminum, iron, and a bunch of other uh, elements that you might be familiar with, like calcium, sodium, potassium, other things like that. But as I mentioned before, the universe, when it first formed, was almost exclusively hydrogen and helium. And so even though, uh, you know, all these elements, there's a lot of elements uh, that are responsible for life as we know it today. And even though most of the earth and most of us are elements other than hydrogen and helium, uh, all these elements comprise only 2% of the total amount of mass uh, in matter in the universe. Today, uh, it's still predominantly hydrogen and helium. And so it's interesting to, to look at and examine, you know, what process change just 2% of that hydrogen helium into all the other elements that we get today, uh, because it has such a dramatic impact on how the universe looks to us today and how you know, every like, physical phenomena in the universe sort of owes itself to the creation and generation of these elements. And so uh, you know, what I want to talk about today a bit is uh, the elements. And so this is a periodic table, as I'm assuming most people have seen in some shape or form uh, at some point in their life. Um, but this, this table just lists all of the elements that we know uh, in order of the number of protons that they have. And I'll talk more about what is a proton in a second. Um, but it's the number of protons that sets the element. So each element has a different number of protons. And you can see you know, hydrogen's on the top left with one proton, helium's in the top right with two. And then the table goes in order left to right, top down, number of protons from one hydrogen all the way up to 118 in some uh, thing I'm not going to try to pronounce. Uh, and so, you know, this is again periodic table. What you're maybe more used to looking at is a periodic table with a little more color. And uh, that would be something like this, maybe that you've, you would have seen in chemistry class at some point. And this colors all these elements that we know by some of their chemical properties. Uh, so again, you have things that are uh, referred to as nonmetals. These are uh, the stuff in yellow, like hydrogen, helium, uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, some of the stuff that makes life, life. Um, you have the metals, and there's a lot of subcategories of metals, but uh, for the sake of this Scott diagram, uh, you know, that's uh, everything else on the basic left side of this, the periodic table is a metal. That includes things like iron, for example, 
uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, silver, gold, right? Things like that. And then in between you have the metalloids, like uh, things like silicon, which make up computer chips uh, and stuff like that. And so the thing I wanna talk to you about today uh, and focus on today is sort of the astronomer's periodic table. Uh, so coloring these things by how I like to think about it as an astronomer in terms of where they come from. Uh, but first, before I get too far ahead of myself, uh, I want to give you sort of a visual on what is an atom and what is an element. And so I, I think I said this before, but the, the number of protons uh, is what determines an element being a different element from, from one another. And so a proton is just a very, very small, what's called subatomic uh, particle. And each element, so a single atom of an element is comprised of three things. And you can see that in this, in this diagram. It's comprised of protons, uh, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons and the neutrons sit in a dense core, a dense nucleus of this atom, and the electrons orbit around on the outside. And so this uh, is a, uh, a visual representation of an atom of carbon, for example. Uh, carbon is somewhat simple. It's a light element. It has six protons, six neutrons. And it's not necessarily the case that you have the same number of protons and neutrons, um, but it is the case that you have the same number of protons and electrons in a uh, typical atom uh, of an element. And to give you an idea of scale, um, you know, these things are incredibly small. So the width of a human hair, for example, uh, is about one million uh, carbon atoms wide. And so you have elements like this, like carbon, again, small, uh, relatively simple. And you get you know, elements that are much more complicated, like uranium, to pick an example. So uranium is much more, much larger. It has uh, 92 protons and 146 neutrons, right? So the total number of protons and neutrons in this case is 238 uh, compared to carbon's 12. So it's quite a bit bigger. Um, and you know, you generate, and I guess the point of this talk is that uh, you know, we started the universe with hydrogen and helium, and then you progressively build up these atoms uh, and, and these elements uh, through the collisions uh, of the of different elements and different atoms and different elements, right? So you go from elements like hydrogen with one proton and helium with two protons to carbon with six, all the way up to uranium with 92 and even higher beyond that. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna show you uh, the, what I mentioned before, the astronomer's periodic table. So first at the beginning of the universe, there was two things, there was hydrogen and helium, uh, and that's colored in blue here. And then there, you know, in truth, that wasn't strictly true. There was maybe a little trace amounts of lithium here. Um, and then uh, one thing I'm not going to talk about uh, is these two elements uh, colored in pink, uh, beryllium and boron. Uh, feel free to ask me about those, those later. Uh, but those are the, really the only two elements that uh, exist that aren't made in stars. Everything else is made in some, some way, shape, or form uh, in stars. And so that includes... Um, elements made from exploding massive stars, which I'll talk about uh, later in this talk. And those are all the things colored in green here. So stuff like oxygen, for example. Uh, those are elements made in exploding white dwarfs, which again, I'll talk about later, uh, which is just sort of an end of life process of stars. Uh, there's dying low mass stars colored in yellow and then merging neutron stars colored in orange. And I'm gonna go ahead and put an asterisk there because that's, uh, you know, somewhere approximately true, and I'll talk about that more later. But the point is that, you know, I could color, so each of these uh, elements is colored by the fraction, roughly, um, uh, fractional sort of source of that element. So again, oxygen, for example, is, is almost entirely uh, uh, originated from exploding massive stars. Uh, iron, for example, is partly exploding massive stars, partly exploding white dwarfs. Um, things like silver is a combination of neutron stars and dying low mass stars. Uh, and the point is that, you know, each individual element comes from a different source uh, in, in the universe. And I'm going to gloss a little bit over on exactly how all these elements are made uh, within stars. So I can focus a little bit more time talking about the sources uh, that you can see in this diagram of where these elements come from. And so first, uh, because, as I said, all these elements, uh, really the one, the one central thing that connects all of these elements, with the exception of the two things in pink, uh, is that they all come in some way, shape, or form from stars. Uh, they, they are either made during the lifetime of that star and released uh, at the death of a star, or they're made while a star is actually dying. And so since these are all, all made in stars, I think it's uh, important to talk a little bit about what is a star and how does a star form in the first place. And so a star, uh, you can think of uh, a star as, um, 
Well, OK, so a star comes uh, forms from the collapsing gas in a galaxy. So in a galaxy is made up of, actually, I'm going to show you an image of what a galaxy looks like. Uh, so this is a, a relatively nearby massive galaxy. Um, I forgot the exact name of this. Uh, I'm sure someone here knows, and we can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. Uh, but this is a, a, a quite massive galaxy. You can see it has sort of spiral features, so it's a spiral galaxy. But you can see very clearly two things in this galaxy. You have stars, which are the bright points uh, spread throughout the galaxy. And you have gas, these sort of dark, uh, denser features uh, in this galaxy. And what happens when stars form is that you have these glass clouds, uh, which eventually become big enough that they become self-gravitating, uh, which means that the total amount of mass within the cloud is, is large enough to start collapsing the cloud under its own weight. Um, so, you know, for example, Earth is held together by its own gravity. We're held to Earth by its own gravity. You know, this is the process in which sort of a structure goes from uh, being completely unassociated with itself to actually starting to, to coalesce and collapse in, in together. And what happens is that over time, this, a gas cloud will collapse and continue to collapse. And it has no way to sort of prevent and overcome the gravity until you reach a really important critical point when that uh, gas becomes so dense at its core uh, and atoms become so close together uh, that those uh, atoms start to fuse together uh, in nuclear reactions. And so initially, if there is no other elements other than hydrogen and helium, it's the point at which the hydrogen and helium begins to fuse together in nuclear reactions. And so to give you an idea of what that sort of gas cloud star formation environment looks like, uh, here's another image of one of these sort of uh, dense gas clouds in our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and you could see that very clearly with these really dense, dense sort of uh, filamentary uh, stream-like gas features. You know, all these sort of dark stuff are dark, dense gas clouds, which may eventually form stars. Uh, but this image is actually showing a region that has already formed stars. You can see them quite clearly um, in this sort of you know, blue region here. So this is a star that formed somewhat recently. And over here, there's more stars that have formed somewhat recently. And the point is that, you know, as, as again, this gas cloud collapses and you begin to, to have nuclear reactions at its core, those nuclear reactions uh, released an incredible amount of energy. And so over time, as the gas cloud collapses, it gets denser, more and more nuclear reactions occur, more and more hydrogen and helium fuses together, so we see more and more energy, and eventually uh, enough energy is generated through that process that the gas cloud begins to heat up dramatically. Uh, and that extra energy generation, that extra temperature, uh, is enough to provide the pressure to support the gas cloud against collapse. And you reach this sort of equilibrium point where the, the cloud is continuing to collapse, but the collapse is continually balanced out perfectly by energy generation from these nuclear reactions in its core. And it's at that exact point when you have that perfect balance that you have a star. And so let's say in this gas cloud, uh, you know, gas collapses, you form a star, and let's say hypothetically you form an average star. And what is an average star? An average star is actually a star that's quite like our sun. So our sun is a typical uh, star in our galaxy. It's one solar mass uh, by definition. Uh, but most of the stars in our galaxy uh, by number are about that, about that size. And so it's not unusual to form a star like our sun. And let's say you did form one of these stars, what's actually happening on the inside? So, well, to give you an image of that, so this is an image of our sun, which is, you know, in many ways, a, a typical average star in our galaxy. So the outer layer is extremely hot. It's a few thousand degrees. And if I look at a slice of what this looks like deep inside, it looks something like this. So at surface of our sun is at 6,000 degrees. And if you go all the way down to the core of the sun, the, the, the star gets denser and denser and denser. And at the very center, it's extremely dense and extremely hot. So for example, our, our sun is at 16 million degrees, uh, roughly speaking. And at those densities, at those temperatures, you're, you're generating tons and tons of nuclear reactions. And that's what's powering uh, our, our, uh, our sun. That's what's powering stars everywhere in the, our galaxy and in the universe. And not only do those nuclear reactions generate energy, but most importantly, for the point of this talk, uh, they generate, and for the point of life in general, uh, those those nuclear reactions generate new elements. So when you fuse hydrogen and helium together, uh, you don't just destroy them. You don't just get hydrogen and helium out. In the end, you actually generate new elements by fusing the proton from the hydrogen with the protons and the neutrons from the helium. 
uh, they combine together to make new elements. Uh, and so in that process, that a process occurs over time uh, in, our, in our sun. And eventually, uh, over time, uh, our sun and stars like it will run out of fuel uh, at the center, at the core. So it will eventually have done this reaction so much that it runs entirely out of hydrogen and helium uh, at the very core of the, of the star uh, and be completely unable to support itself uh, against collapse again. And so due to a few little quirks about stellar uh, physics, which we could also talk about in Q&A, uh, what happens in that process is, is not the whole star collapses, but just the central dense core of that star begins to collapse further. And as that happens, the outer envelope uh, of the star becomes uh, unbound from the central dense core. And the st our star, or our sun and stars like it, uh, will start to grow over time. And so as the core collapses, which is where all these reactions were occurring, the outer shells begin to expand. And those outer shells are polluted uh, to some degree with some of the elements that were made uh, during the star's lifetime. And over time, the star will completely shed those outer layers into what's called the planetary nebula. But really, those outer layers get shed and distributed throughout the galaxy uh, that the star resides in. And so this is how a star like our sun uh, makes elements throughout its lifetime and releases them into uh, the galaxy. And it's this process occurs many, many times repeatedly over the whole entire universe uh, to generate the elements that we see today. And what's left behind, which I'll talk about in a second, is the dense core. Uh, and again, a shell of sort of enriched, uh, enriched gas with new elements. And so the elements that come from this process are the elements that sort of are labeled yellow uh, in this periodic table. These are the elements that come from dying low mass stars. So that's things like carbon, which is central to life. Uh, things like nitrogen, um, strontium, and barium, which you might know as the uh, things that make fireworks look pretty. Uh, so strontium is what gives fireworks red colors, and barium is what gives fireworks green colors, uh, and they're used for other things as well. Um, there's other elements you can see here uh, uh, around here, and there's other elements uh, sort of that are more massive than these that also get made uh, in dying low mass stars. And so uh, as I mentioned before, you know, you, you, you're left with two things. You're left with that dense core and you're left with the shell of gas that gets released uh, into the galaxy with newly enriched elements. And so that dense core that's left behind is what's called a white dwarf, which I mentioned uh, a little bit ago. And that white dwarf is really just a very, very dense uh, ball of, um, of sort of a leftover um, fuel from, from the nuclear reactions that were occurring at the center of these stars. And so for our sun, for example, um, at the end of its lifetime, it will leave behind a white dwarf that's comprised of a helium. And um, in some cases with some stars, also things like carbon and neon. Uh, and, and so the, the properties of, that, of this white dwarf are such that, you know, even though it has elements, so in principle, uh, it could fuse those elements together to make, to make more elements, to generate more energy. Uh, the, this core is not massive enough by itself to actually uh, generate those nuclear reactions. So it's sort of a dead star uh, in, in some respects. But the properties of that white dwarf are such that there is a critical mass where if somehow, by, through some process, it were to increase its mass over time, it would sort of hit a critical point where it would, would dramatically and almost instantaneously trigger uh, nuclear reactions uh, throughout the white dwarf, causing the entire thing to just sort of explode all at once. And there's two different ways that can happen. One way is you can have two white dwarfs that sort of collide together and combine, and maybe they surpass that mass, mass threshold, uh, nuclear reactions occur, and the star explodes dramatically. Or you might have a situation where you have a white dwarf, which is sort of illustrated here in this artist's uh, rendition um, on the left, uh, that's sort of sucking uh, gas from a nearby companion star. Uh, and eventually, uh, at some point, it might accrue enough mass around the white dwarf to hit this mass threshold, uh, begin nuclear reactions again, and explode. Uh, and in that process, this generates a ton more elements than the star would have uh, throughout its normal lifetime. And these are, again, the elements co colored by the light blue. So these are elements originating from exploding white dwarfs. Uh, important things like iron, for example, uh, also nickel, um, let's see, copper, zinc, uh, sulfur, a bunch of other elements. Uh, and so, you know, really, the again, since white dwarfs come from dying low mass stars, 
uh, dying low mass stars, you know, synthesize elements throughout their lifetime, but also even after uh, the end of their life, uh, they are still in some situations capable of making even more elements uh, through these dramatic uh, explosions of white dwarfs. And these are called uh, type 1a supernovae, if you've ever heard of that before. And they are some of the sort of most energetic and uh, sort of brightest events in our universe. So we can see them happening in galaxies very far from us. And so, you know, let's say instead of an average star, um, let's say you make a much more massive star. Uh, and I separate these two, two out in this discussion because they do have uh, sort of very different properties throughout their lifetime and very different sort of end of life phases, as I'll uh, talk about in a second. And so by massive star, I mean a star that's maybe eight or 10 times more massive than our own sun, uh, all the way up to something that's maybe 100 times uh, uh, more massive than our own sun. And so in this massive star, it's actually uh, has enough mass to support, uh, to, to have to reach high enough densities at its core and high enough temperatures at its core uh, to have much more, uh, um, much heavier nuclear reactions going on in its core. So unlike our sun, which might stop producing elements at you know, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, uh, this star is, all, is able to synthesize elements all the way up to iron. Um, and so at the end of its life, uh, one of these massive stars may look something like this. And you kind of like the onion type feature where you have uh, sort of the, the, the products of various nuclear reactions that have occurred in a star over time, sort of sitting in sort of a shell-like uh, structure inside. And so, like I said, that's things like carbon, nitrogen, neon, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, all the way up to iron. And there's a quirk about nuclear physics uh, that's such that, you know, once iron is produced in its core, uh, it's not really energetically favorable to, to, to have nuclear reactions occur past iron. Uh, and at that point, the star begins to be unable su to support itself against gravity. And this is much like the same situation for our own sun when it uh, ran out of fuel in its center. This is the equivalent process, except it's a more massive star. And so when it runs out of the ability to generate nuclear reactions at its core, uh, just like the low mass stars, it will begin to collapse under the weight of gravity. Um, but unlike the low mass stars, rather than having a sort of a collapsing core and expanding outer shell, the whole star will begin to collapse. And these stars are so massive uh, that uh, it will begin to collapse all the way until uh, uh, it hits uh, a very, it, it hits a certain moment uh, in its core where uh, the densities become high enough that the electrons and the protons and those atoms that I showed you earlier actually fuse together and generate neutrons. And in that process, that generates so much energy that this explodes as what's called a type two or core collapse uh, supernova. And this GIF sort of illustrates kind of what that would look like uh, very roughly. So this, you know, a normal star uh, or normal massive star shown here initially in the image will explode in a, in a, you know, extremely bright and energetic explosion, releasing all the elements that were made in that star throughout its lifetime into the galaxy. And the elements that come from exploding massive stars are, for example, oxygen, which is really important for life, obviously. Uh, things like sodium or magnesium, uh, potassium, aluminum, silicon, uh, really quite a large number of the elements that are sort of on the lower uh, uh, mass side of the periodic table are made from these exploding massive stars. And in the end, at the end of that process, uh, once the star has exploded, actually, sorry, I forgot where I was in my talk. Uh, I was going to pause for a second <laughs> uh, and to, to sort of step, take a step back. So I've talked a bit about uh, different uh, sources for different elements. I haven't touched yet on merging neutron stars, which I will in a second, but I've talked about exploding massive stars, exploding white dwarfs, about dying low mass stars. And I wanted to take a step back and sort of uh, think about how this happens on galactic scales over the, over the course of the whole universe. And to give you a light, nice visual picture of sort of uh, the evolution of galaxies and the, the evolution of, of the universe. And so this is a simulation, uh, a visualization from a simulation uh, that sort of illustrates this process quite well. Uh, I'm going to fast forward a tiny bit, maybe. Um, actually, no, I'll just let it run. So what this is, is a, a vis visualization of a galaxy that looks roughly like we think our own Milky Way looks like. So it has giant spiral arms. You can see stars in the simulated galaxy as sort of the twinkling things and the bright points uh, in the galaxy itself. 
you can see gas swirling around uh, the center of the galaxy. But what I want you to pay attention to is the red stuff that keeps popping in and out uh, throughout this galaxy. And so those red globs or, or, or balls of gas, roughly, sort of trace uh, the enriched elements that have been produced um, from these stars uh, as, they, as they live, as they evolve, as they collapse and explode. And what you can see is that you know, this is a process that's occurring all over the galaxy uh, almost all the time. I mean, the simulation is sped up, so it's much faster uh, than it's evolving in real life. But you can see that, you know, again, this is a process that's happening everywhere. And so once these elements get released into the galaxy, they mix with the rest of the gas and evolve over the galaxy in repeated uh, explosions uh, over time. And so as the gas gets enriched uh, with new elements and new, new, new metals, uh, it forms new stars out of that enriched gas, and the cycle continues and continues and continues until you get to the point where we are today, where we've gone through, again, many generations of this, which is what's responsible for sort of the Earth existing and us existing on, on the Earth. OK, so back to stars. So once a supernova explodes, as I, as I mentioned a second ago, what's left behind is a dense core uh, called a neutron star. And as I mentioned a second ago, uh, that comes about by the protons and the electrons and the elements of that core being fused together and turned into neutrons. And so neutrons are incredibly dense star, sort of dead stars that are comprised, well, entirely of neutrons. Um, and I'll just mention for the sake of mentioning it that one other possibility is that you can create a black hole. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that here because uh, if you do create a black hole through that collapse, uh, then that doesn't actually produce any elements. They all get sucked into the black hole. Um, but for these neutron stars, uh, they themselves don't synthesize any elements. They don't make any elements. But much like the white dwarfs, where you can have two white dwarfs colliding, you can also have two neutron stars. Uh, they may be orbiting each other, and maybe over time, those neutron stars merge together, collide. And in that process, well, sorry, this uh, movie didn't start right on time. So these, this image shows uh, two neutron stars orbiting each other, getting faster and faster as they get closer and closer together. And eventually, it will explode. And through this process, uh, they release what's called gravitational waves, uh, which if you've maybe uh, heard about recently is like some, some of the most exciting sort of science results over the past uh, few decades, certainly, has been the detection of the first gravitational waves, uh, which was detected from merging neutron stars. And eventually, those neutron stars might explode in an, in an also incredibly energetic uh, explosion, as you can see here. And again, this artist's representation of what, what this process actually looks like. And when those neutron stars uh, collide and explode, uh, they themselves also synthesize other elements. And these are usually some of the more massive elements, like silver, uh, gold over here, platinum, um, and a few other things. And the, the reason why I had an ast oh, uranium is an, also another example. And the reason why I had an asterisk on this before is that uh, it's still really a, a very vibrant uh, and interesting field of active research into exactly how much uh, neutron stars are responsible for generating all the silver that we uh, know of in the universe today. I mean, so we know that if, if, you, if, if and when two neutron stars merge together, it will produce all these elements. But exactly what fraction of neutron stars versus dying low mass stars versus exploding massive stars versus white dwarfs are responsible for any amount of uh, different elements in our own galaxy versus a different galaxy uh, is still a really open open question in research today. And that's one of the things that I'm interested in studying uh, myself, and as there are many people at, at Caltech and Carnegie uh, who, who do this as well. And so back to that picture of a galaxy, uh, I'll wrap up with giving you a better appreciation for sort of how galaxies evolve and the role this plays. Uh, so this is a, is a really beautiful visualization, again, of a different simulation of a galaxy evolving. And you can see here, uh, the center of this image is showing the gas from this galaxy evolving uh, from very early times in the universe till now. You can see the galaxy is sort of this more massive thing in the center of the image. Gas is falling in. Sometimes you'll see dense gas clumps falling in, which are themselves uh, smaller galaxies that merge with this sort of more massive central galaxy. You could see a little panel here shows an image of the stars in this galaxy zoomed in. This is a zoomed in image of the, the galaxy. But the point I want you to, to take away from this is that, you know, again, this process is happening. These elements are being synthesized through stars, uh, you know, many times over throughout the 14 billion years that the universe has existed. 
uh, but that galaxies themselves aren't uh, completely isolated and independent, right? Our Milky Way is built up over the merger of many galaxies over time. And this is true for other galaxies. Uh, and even still, you know, even not counting galaxies that have merged with our own, our own Milky Way is not entirely isolated. It's being orbited by 50 plus uh, smaller, what's called dwarf galaxies. And so the point is that, you know, our galaxy sits in this giant ecosystem of other galaxies. And the reality is that, you know, the elements that make up you and I today were certainly synthesized in stars, but the, the fact that our own galaxy is built up by many galaxies over time, and the fact that our own galaxy sits in an environment around other galaxies means that the elements that make up you and I today uh, may have been synthesized in a star in a different galaxy in a different time, long, long time ago, uh, than our own. So not only are we sort of the, the remnants of different stars, uh, but we also could be sort of the remnants of uh, stars made in, in different galaxies. And this last movie I'm going to show sort of gives you a visual, visualization of that. So this is, it's a bit jumpy, but this central image here is a, is a zoom in of, of a central massive galaxy. And all these little circles orbiting around represent some of the satellite galaxies, the smaller galaxies orbiting this more massive galaxy. And I'll play it again. Um, and the green stuff is gas in those galaxies that are enriched with elements being accreted onto the central more massive galaxy. So this very clearly shows a sort of transfer of elements produced in different galaxies onto a more massive galaxy, potentially like our own. So again, the, the sort of food for thought I want to leave you today is, you know, you may have heard the whole, the old, uh, I guess not that old, but you may have heard the, the, you know, the, the saying that we are just star stuff. And that's certainly true, but we are star stuff that again, could be made in, in the galaxy, uh, in our own galaxy or in a different galaxy uh, at any, any point in the universe. Uh, and I, you know, that's sort of the thing I like thinking about and thing I'm, I'm interested in, in research. So I'm happy to talk about this uh, as much as, as you guys want uh, in the Q&A. So thank you for coming. Awesome. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was excellent. Okay. I would like to, in, uh, to ask our other Q&A panel members to join, join the Zoom. Sarah, are you there? There you are. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was excellent. Thank you very much, Andrew. So many of you have been asking questions in the YouTube comment section. That's great. We will try and address those now. Um, before we get started, I just like the other members of our, our panel. We, we already know what Andrew works on. Uh, he's been talking about it at some level over the, 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 through the content of his presentation. I do somewhat related stuff. I do uh, computational modeling of galaxies, much like Andrew was discussing. My focus is more on more massive systems, more massive galaxies, not dwarf galaxies. And, and I also look primarily at the low density gas in the outskirts of those galaxies and what that tells us about fueling for star formation and merger histories and that sort of thing. And there was a talk that was kind of about that by Yu Guang Chen a few months ago. He was more on the observational side, but it's called the circumgalactic medium. So that's kind of a, a primer on what I, I work on. But uh, perhaps, Sarah, would you like to to go next and, and introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Cameron. Uh, so my name is Sarah Blunt. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm a first year graduate student at Caltech. I'm a planet hunter. So I look for uh, exoplanets or planets orbiting stars outside of our solar system. So I try to find uh, as many of these planets as I can uh, and try to find interesting new planets um, and learn as much about them, th their physical properties and their orbits as I can. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Dr. Ilaria Cayazzo. I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thank you. You're getting better every time in pronouncing my name. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm a postdoc, postdoctoral researcher at Caltech, and uh, I work mostly on 
stars on like I'm really interested in the physical processes behind their evolution uh, and in what happens after they die. I do a lot of work on white dwarfs and neutron stars, which uh, Andrew already talked about a lot. Mostly theoretical work, but I like doing observations sometimes as well. Excellent. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we encourage you to ask your questions uh, related to the things that, that Andrew said or that the other panelists have discussed or just whatever, throw, throw whatever you've got at us and we'll try and address it as best we can. Um, so I'm gonna start asking some questions of the, of the panelists that you guys have been asking us. Um, so some that were related to the content of the talk, let's see. When heavy elements are formed, do the isotopes form in a certain proportion? And that can that be used to sort of carbon date uh, certain certain gas or stars to find the age of the universe when when those were formed or something like that? Uh, yeah, I can I can say something about that. So the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is. Uh, well, here, the short answer is yes. And so there have been people who have made attempts to try and do this uh, in stars near us. And, um, I, the, but the, the short answer, or the longer answer is that uh, it can be quite challenging to make those observations in detail and really pick apart exactly how much of an element of a certain isotope uh, is in a, in a star. Um, but, and the answer that tells you is, is it gives you sort of a relative age for how old that star could possibly be. Um, so that's an important, important research. And the other, the other thing that makes this a bit difficult is that, um, you know, doing this well sort of relies on having a very detailed and accurate models uh, of how much iso of a certain isotope you expect to form versus another, um, which is also challenging to do um, and still an area of, of very active research now. Cool. Awesome. Um, Somewhat related to that question, I guess related to the most, much of the content of the talk, is there any explanation for why technetium and promethium are not made in the stars? Because remember when you showed your, your plot of the periodic table and it had them all, all the, the, the elements were colored according to, you know, these come from stars or these come from supernova or whatnot. Technetium, and, which is element, 43 and promethium, which I think is, I don't know, 62, something like that. Um, I used to, I used to have them all down, but it's been way too long. So um, those were stark because they were gray and they didn't have any naturally, uh, natural sources. And so that's part of the reason technetium is called technetium is because we didn't have like sources on earth, natural sources for this. And it had to be like technically created, artificially created. Um, so the answer, I'm going to, I'm going to try and answer this, but Andrew or Sarah or Ilaria, feel free to chime in as well. Um, those two elements don't have any stable isotopes. They, they all will radioactively decay in one way or another, either through, uh, in, in those two particular ones, I think they're both, I know technetium is beta decay and electron capture, depending on the isotope, which is to say it either spews out an electron from its nucleus, thereby changing the, the, the element, or it, it captures an electron into the nucleus and does the same thing. So it changes it to the elements surrounding it. And the, the longest half-lives for those, I, I just looked this up, so don't think that I have like half-lives of weird technetium isotopes memorized because I don't. But uh, the longest half-lives are like in the millions of years. Some are in the, the, the like hours, so they decay super, super fast. But the point is that these are formed through uranium decay and that sort of thing, which we have lots of uranium around. Well, not lots, but we have enough in the Earth environment. But it's just been sitting around for so long that this decays really, really quickly, and it's very difficult to find this naturally. Anyway, um, Andrew, do you want to add anything to that, or does anyone else want to add? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is actually this gets at um, you know the two elements I had colored uh, pink in the periodic table. Um, why why I said those aren't made in stars um, is that so those elements, beryllium and boron, unlike technetium and the other one, is that uh, they do have stable isotopes. 
Um, but the isotopes of those that are made in stars are not stable. Um, and so as an example for beryllium, I just looked this up, the, the half-life decay of beryllium uh, that's made in the nuclear actions in our, in our sun is uh, 10 to the negative 17 seconds. <laughs> so it's almost uh, like it's, you know, never there. Uh, and it's only, and the, the interesting thing is that, you know, it's, it, it's actually an important uh, stage in the nuclear reactions to make heavier elements. Uh, and even though its half-life is so short, the densities in the center of a star is, are so high that even though it exists for just a brief moment in time, that there is still a, not, a, a decent chance that another atom will come by and collide with that uh, beryllium for the you know, very, very split second that it happens to, to exist. OK, cool. Uh, there was one clarification. One member of the audience asked about red dwarfs. Uh, I thought red dwarfs were the most popular star type. But there was, yeah, there was some clarification that was needed. Andrew or Sarah, do you guys want to discuss this at all? I, I'm happy to pass on yeah, me answering it, but I can, I can say words. <laughs> um, uh, I was, I was, so admittedly, I was being a bit flippant when I was saying uh, the sun was the most, or sort of average or typical or popular star. Uh, and I think that's mostly because I spend my time thinking about galaxies and not stars themselves. Um, so you're right, I, a red dwarf is, there are more red dwarfs than stars like our sun, uh, but a red dwarf's mass is about, uh, I think it's like 0.6 to 0.8 uh, times the mass of our sun. And so from, from my perspective as someone who thinks about galaxies, that's, you know, that's basically one. Uh, so that's why I, I said that, but. <laughs> Don't worry, that's, that's okay. Um, there was a question. I like this question and I have to think about it a bit, but perhaps this is a good one for discussion. Have we reached a point where no more new elements are possible? Um, yeah, maybe this is best as, as kind of a discussion amongst all of us, because if you look at the periodic table, Andrew, do you want to bring, bring that back up and screen share? Uh, yeah, just give me one second. Yeah, no worries. So if you look at the periodic table, obviously we started at the, at the bottom with hydrogen and helium. And as Andrew was saying, a little bit of um, beryllium and boron and such that were, that were formed in the, in, in the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. But the rest of the stuff has been built up by stars. And as you get heavier and heavier, excuse me, higher and higher atomic number, so farther down to the right on the periodic table, you, you have more nucleons, you have more protons and neutrons in the interior. And there appears to be something about stability that as you go higher and higher, as we were talking about, like whether it's technetium or, or, or uh, promethium or some of these higher elements, they just tend to be more unstable and will decay rapidly. Sometimes on, as Andrew was saying, like ridiculously short timescales so that you don't have, it, it turns into a different element. It radioactively decays to another element. So you no longer have that element. And so most of the ones above like 90, well, not 90, 92 is uranium, but most of the ones, I guess this doesn't go that high. Sometimes periodic tables will extend beyond, or most will extend through the, the um, actinides and the lanthanides. Yeah, do you have, okay, here we go. Yeah, so once you get into the like the high 90s and the hundreds and the hundred and teens, those elements have only been created in a lab for like some of them like nanoseconds or milliseconds, super, super short time scales because they'll decay really, really fast. So I don't I don't know. My guess is in in to try and respond to that question, like you can create them for an instant, perhaps under the right conditions. I just don't think that they may last for very long. But there may be, I mean, people have talked about like a stability island that may be farther, higher atomic numbers that might, you know, all of a sudden under the right conditions, you put together this element and poof, it stays there. And it has, you know, maybe that's unobtainium or, or one of these fancy elements that people talk about in science fiction. I don't know. Um, do other people want to chime in on this? I'm just rambling at this point, so. I think, you know, if you think about the 
physics that goes behind, like nuclear physics. Um, you know, protons repel each other just because they're positive, right? And so it's it's harder and harder. Like it, the nucleus works a little bit like a drop of water. It has some surface tension that keeps it together, and that helps. Like the more uh, neutrons that you have, because um, it's um, because the neutrons don't repel each other, right? So at certain point, like if you go higher and higher in the periodic table, you see that it's not, it's no more like equal number of protons and neutrons and you start having like more neutrons and more neutrons just to get to the point that it's very hard to keep the thing all together. Uh, just in terms of, a, you know, the, the force that go in there, like there's the nuclear forces that keep it together. They look a little bit like this surface. Uh, tension, but you, you know, it's the same as you cannot have a drop of water that stays together if it's too big. I think the same thing is that with the nucleus, it, it becomes also, it's not only the fact that they decay very quickly, I think it, it becomes harder and harder to keep it together. I would agree with all that. That's a, that's a perfect analogy. Thank you, Laria. Um, do you guys have anything to add? Okay. But I, I don't know. I, I the thing about we reached a limit, uh, that's that's that is not like I've, it's not my field at all, like chemistry and like creating new elements. So I don't know if we actually reached a limit that we cannot create a new one. I'm pretty sure we can create a new one. Yeah, I think uh, it's just our, our own technological limit at this point. Like we only have such large super colliders to be able to slam things together to be able to instantaneously like put the conditions such that you can form one of these for a very short period but i think that's just a limitation of how how energetic our particle colliders are and stars are obviously a lot more energetic than cern or the large hadron collider or something like that so so for example in the surfaces of neutron star where there's like a very 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 high density like it's like this a lab condition that it cannot really ever create it on earth like the density is like so high and you have very weird atom nuclei where we have like many protons and many neutrons but they seem they seem to be still normal elements it's just you know the element is identified by the number of protons not by the number of uh, uh neutrons right and so in the surface of the neutron star you have this very weird at uh, nuclei which are still like for example iron but instead of being iron with 26 neutrons and 26 protons is iron with 26 protons and 200 neutrons. So like even, even in this, there are, we know of the existence of very weird new uh, um, uh, atoms, but still not new elements. Like, I don't know about the elements, like getting to, it's, it's one thing is slamming uh, nucleons together, so protons and neutrons. One thing is having many protons, like new, you know, going higher and higher in the number of protons, which is what creates an element, right? I think that that's much harder. Yeah, I agree. Uh, related to this, there was a question. How do you know if there is not a soup of quarks in the center of large stars? That, that's a very good question. <laughs> Um, I can Maybe we should introduce what quarks are to the audience before we get into a soup of quarks. <laughs> okay, so neutrons, so, okay, the nuclei of atoms are formed of neutrons and protons, okay, but the protons and neutrons themselves, they're not elementary particles, which means that they are made of something else, and this something else are quarks, which are like even smaller uh, particles, that it's very hard though to get them out of the neutrons and the protons. That's why we don't really see them. It took a very long time to discover them because they're almost never separated. They are always together to form either a neutron or a proton. Um, and so uh, the question is interesting because you know at very high energies, like in the colliders in Geneva, for example, at the LHC, the Large Hydrogen Collider, we slam them together like protons versus proton. And in this very high energy, very high temperature, these quarks get separated from each other. So the protons actually disaggregate into their quarks. There's usually three for each proton. Uh, and the same with neutrons, we can actually liberate the quarks at very high energy and very high temperatures. And, and it's, it's 
a very good question about the center of stars because so the center of normal stars uh, the temperatures and density rich there they're just not high enough for the protons to disaggregate so we know that there's nuclear burning going on in there so the temperature is high enough for having nuclear burning but no nowhere near uh, the temperatures that we need for quarks to come out so we are pretty certain of that um, but there are other type of stars, which are neutron stars, that reach not really, the temperatures are very, very high, but they reach so high densities that we ask ourselves, maybe, so we see these quarks coming out at very, very high temperatures, but maybe at very, very high densities, they could come out as well, just because you slam the protons together so densely so finally that that at some point they will just merge and and turn out into the quark soup so that's something we do not know it, people theorize it and you know there's we are still trying to observe neutron stars to understand if that's the case so that can happen at the center of neutron stars but because neutron stars are much 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 more dense than a normal star uh, if you take the sun for example so neutron star is not very massive it's the same mass of our sun you know, the sun is like 600,000 kilometers in radius, okay? But so the neutron star has the same mass, but the radius of the neutron star is about 10 kilometers. So you have to squeeze the entire sun into like the size of city, and then you get a neutron star. And that's why it, you might have even have quark soup in the middle, just because they're like so immensely dense, but, but not normal stars. But, okay. So normal stars, no quark soup, but neutron stars, an exotic star like neutron stars could potentially be dense enough to have the quark soup. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. It's, it's a possibility. Okay. But are there observational signatures that those would have that we could pick up or? So, um, you know, the one thing is uh, that people have, think of, have thought about that could help us understand is what's the mass of the neutron star, the maximum mass of a neutron star. Because, you know, normal stars are kept up by, you know, the pressure of the nuclear burning, right? You know, you, you have stars, like the life of stars is really this, this fight against collapse because the star is under its own self-gravitation, right? And it would, gravity would just make it collapse. And, you know, normal stars, they are kept up by the fact that there's energy created in the center by nuclear burning. But neutron stars don't have that. There's no nuclear burning going on. And so what's really keeping it up is this thing called, you know, neutron degeneracy. So it's all these quantum processes for which neutrons don't really like to be together. Protons don't really like to be, to be together. And so you can kind of figure out what kind of pressure is inside the, the neutron star to keep it up by just imagining what's inside. So if I have neutrons, that the kind of pressure I expect, and this is how it can keep up. And the same with quarks, you can theoretically um, calculate this pressure. And then you can say, okay, what's the, if that's the pressure, then what's the radius of the neutron star? You know, because if you have, it's, it's called like hydrostatic equilibrium calculations, but it says, if you know, if you know what's the pressure, uh, you can, in, if you know the mass of the star, then you can imagine, okay, if it's very, very high pressure, then the star has to be big for a certain mass. If it's very, very low pressure, then it's going to be more compressed. So that's the idea. So one thing that could help us is measuring the radius and the mass of one neutron star, which is very hard. And it's, it's, we are maybe doing it right now. There's, one, there's been one measurement from, from one, which is still a little bit uncertain. But this could help. This, this kind of measurement could help, measuring the mass and the radius of the neutron star. We'll okay. I don't want to. <laughs> no, that's great. Time. <laughs> okay. um, we had a question on exoplanets that I think would be appropriate for our exoplanet expert, Sarah. Is anyone looking for exoplanets by sorting out the plasma bubbles released by planetary magnetic fields into the stellar ambiance? So. Uh, I think the best answer I can give is sort of. Um, so stars uh, emit what are called stellar winds, which is ionized material that flows out from the surface of the star. So there's this 
steady stream of material that's flowing away from the star. And planets act as sort of like, uh, planets uh, perturb that flow. So if you imagine like waters flowing down a river and there's a rock in the middle of the river, you get these sort of ripples of the water around the rock. And so the same thing is happening uh, if you have a planet orbiting and it's getting, getting in the way of the stellar wind. And this planet actually excites waves in the stellar wind uh, that are different from the flow uh, of the stellar wind away from the star. Um, so these are like sort of the ripples of the planet uh, blocking the flow of the stellar wind. And so these waves can actually be detected uh, in a lot of different ways. So there are some ways that have been uh, potentially successful. There have been like marginal detections of this effect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one example is people look for uh, people have looked for hot spots on the surfaces of stars uh, that are caused by these uh, these uh, star planet uh, waves excited in the stellar wind plasma. Um, there's other ways of looking for it. You can also look for the radio signature of these uh, hot spots and waves. Um, and there's probably other ways to do it that I don't know about, uh, but. Yeah, this is a really big uh, area of research right now, looking for star-planet interactions. So you'll probably hear more about this in the next couple of years. That's super exciting. Yeah, cool stuff. Another planet, maybe not exoplanet, but planet-related question related to the talk as well. Earth's atmosphere is 21% oxygen. Mercury's is 42% oxygen. Uh, Setting aside temperature and radiation, could we breathe the air on Mercury? Or, uh, yeah, what what uh, our our planet expert can do? You wanna do you wanna handle this one? Sure, I can handle this one too. Um, so, uh, no, <laughs> the answer is no. Um, and the reason is because Mercury's atmosphere is so thin compared to Earth's atmosphere. So even if Mercury's atmosphere was 100% oxygen, there just wouldn't be enough stuff there for us to be able to breathe. Um, I did a quick like order of magnitude comparison between uh, the amount of atmospheric pressure on the surface of Earth versus the amount of atmospheric pressure on the surface of Mercury. So on the surface of Earth, we have uh, 100 kilopascals is the uh, sea level uh, just, uh, uh, amount of pressure from the atmosphere. Uh, so that's 10 to the 5. or uh, And um, on Mercury, the pressure at the surface is a nanopascal, or 10 to the minus 9 pascals. So uh, Earth's atmospheric pressure is 10 to the 14 times larger than Mercury's atmospheric pressure. Uh, so 14 orders of magnitude difference. So you could you could have many 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 uh, mercury atmospheres worth of stuff and still not be able to breathe. Okay. Yeah, I was confused by that question because I always had had thought that mercury had zero atmosphere. I thought it was just like devoid of atmosphere. It had all been burned off or blown away by the sun. Um, so I I'm happy to learn that it does have an atmosphere. It's just extremely extremely low pressure and density. Very yeah, cool. very tenuous. Most of uh, the lighter elements have been blown off. Okay. Uh, let's see, what's next? Here is a question for Andrew. Can you talk about, uh, talk more about cosmic ray fusion and why beryllium and boron are not formed in stars? Yeah, so uh, beryllium and boron are the two elements that I have in the periodic table that weren't formed from stars. Are uh, so they they are made uh, in 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 some amounts in stars, but the the isotopes uh, of beryllium and boron and, and an isotope is just uh, it has the same number of protons, just different number of neutrons. Uh, but the particular isotopes that are made in stars don't last long, and so all the beryllium and boron that exists today were formed outside of stars. Uh, and one of the ways to do that, and the way we think that actually happens to make the beryllium and boron is, is called cosmic ray fusion. Uh, and so that's when you have a cosmic ray, which is just a really energetic particle. It could be an electron, it could be a proton, it could be like a helium atom. Uh, it's just some, some atom, some particle that got accelerated to almost relativistic or relativistic velocity. So it's you know, an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. 
uh, collides with a different nucleus, a different atom that happens to exist uh, in, in the gas in a galaxy. Uh, and so beryllium and boron, for example, uh, can form when one of these cosmic rays collides with helium, uh, for example, in, in a galaxy. Um, and this can happen for other elements as well. So slightly more massive elements can also be formed uh, in some amounts um, from this process. Uh, it's just not the dominant way it happens for, for most elements. Excellent. Okay, here's, here's a question that I can help address as well as other panelists. How much computing power and or hard drive space do you need to simulate the formation of a galaxy? Now, Andrew and I work on slightly different galaxies as we've kind of alluded. I work primarily on more Milky Way scale galaxies, which is to say they're kind of referred to as, as giant galaxies, but they're, they're kind of middle of the pack galaxies, I'd say. Kind of like the sun is in the spectrum of different sizes of stars. And then there are dwarf galaxies, which is what uh, Andrew more focuses on, which are somewhere between 100 to 10,000 times smaller in terms of mass. Would you say that? I mean, we, we've ultra, like the, 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 lowest, the lowest mass ones have been discovered down to halo mass of like 10 to the seven solar masses. Yeah, I mean, you could get down to like, there's only a you know, few thousand stars uh, in, in the galaxy. Right. Uh, they can get that small. So right. compared to, you know, billions. <laughs> right. So generally, as you might imagine, when you're simulating these things, the more stuff is there, the more volume it takes up and the more computing power you need to be able to simulate it. So I can't speak for the dwarfs because I haven't done any dwarf simulations, but for the simulations that we run for Milky Way mass galaxies, again, I guess that the bigger constraint is we're gonna put as much computing power as we can into this. Uh, so we're really limited by the, the, the computational resources on, on which we're running. So if you have a supercomputer from 20 years ago, we'll run it on that and we'll do kind of a crummy job. Or if we do it on the fastest supercomputer today, we can do the same size galaxies. Um, but, but we'll just do a much better job. Our precision and accuracy will be much better. So nowadays, the simulations that we're doing, so I'm part of a couple of different consortia. The most well-known one I'm part of is called the FIRE simulations. FIRE is an acronym standing for feedback in relativistic, not in relativistic, in realistic environments. We don't want to worry about relativity for these sorts of things. FIRE in realistic environments. Uh, Andrew's also a part of that collaboration as well. And that, those are Zoom simulations. Oh, maybe I'll try and put a movie later into this, but I'm not going to fiddle with it right now. Uh, a movie showing the evolution of one of these things. The movies that you showed earlier, those were illustrious TNG movies? Uh, yeah, the, the one with the many little panels was illustrious. And then the very last one was a fire. Uh, oh, it was? Okay, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, so these these simulations will take on the order of What Firebox is or Illustrious is like 100 million CPU hours, something like that. Normally, the zoom simulations for a Milky Way sized galaxy are like, depending on how precise, at the, at the highest level of precision we're doing, like Triple Latte, I think, is 30 million CPU hours. So that's to say, if I were to run it on my laptop with one CPU, it would take 30 million hours, which is unfathomably unfathom long. Uh, so what you do is you run it on a supercomputer where it has lots of different processors and it's running, you know, part of the simulation on this processor and another part on this processor, and then it combines all the results together and you can run it on a thousand cores or a thousand processors at the same time, or even as many as I think the largest supercomputers right now that are accessible by civilians, not military. Um, what, uh, DOE has hundred thousand CPU? What's Frontera? Frontera is on the order of 100,000 or two, maybe 200,000 cores that you can run on simultaneously. So anyway, big computers running with lots of uh, parallel processors. And, and then the size, it's kind of dependent on the, uh, the um, 
the software code that you use, whether or not you're discretizing space to be particles or you're doing it based on, on grid elements. Grid element simulations tend to be larger in file size because they're containing more uh, information and in, in how it breaks up the volume. I'd say, so the Tempest simulations I did, those outputs, simulation outputs were, so for a snapshot in time, the distribution of all the matter was on the order of uh, think like 50 gigs for one snapshot. And then you output like 500 of those to make a movie. So it takes up a lot of space. Um, but with the dwarfs, with the dwarf galaxies, those should be considerably smaller, right? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, as you said, we'll use up as much computer time as we have. So although the dwarfs are cheaper, uh, like for fixed resolution, uh, because they're cheaper at fixed resolution, you could just add more resolution. So <laughs> they uh, they also tend to be a lot of time. But but yeah, it's uh, they're definitely smaller um, than that. But. Yeah. So we're extremely lucky to to have these resources that are generally paid for by federal taxpayers' money uh, through the National Science Foundation, through NASA, uh, through the Department of Energy, and these build these massive national level supercomputers that then scientists as well as 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 uh you know anyone can apply for time on these these are shared resources essentially what you do is you 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 submit a proposal to one of these computing facilities and say hey i've got this cool science project science project it's not like a science fair but you know, i've got this really cool idea for solving this science problem that has you know confounded scientists for a decade or whatever. And I, I can do this and I can solve this or I can investigate this problem with a, a pretty good chance of resolving this problem if you give me X amount of time on your supercomputer. And so then a panel reads all of these proposals from different scientists at different institutions or maybe even people who are just at home but have to demonstrate that they have uh, technical ability to be able to do what they're saying that they can do. And then they dole out these resources. And so you get the supercomputing time and, and use it and hopefully do what you said you were going to do. And that's how the, the field moves forward. It's kind of like a shared resource, like a telescope, except we're theorists instead of observers. Anything anybody else wants to add? Andrew, Alari, Sarah? No? Okay. Okay. More questions, more questions. How do scientists determine the likelihood of an element formed by a particular process? Um, for example, why are elements like thallium more likely to come from dying low mass stars than merging neutron stars based on the, the, the table you were showing earlier, Andrew? Yeah, so the, uh, I'll say the, the colors in that table and like their exact ratio for a given element um, is is a, sort of dependent on I guess what's baked into those those values uh, are sort of models for what nuclear reactions can and do occur uh, in certain stars um, uh, models that say how many uh, stars of a certain mass exist so you can sort of add up you know the sum total of all the uh, nuclear reactions that occur in those stars. Um, uh, and add up sort of all the uh, the stars that you expect in a given galaxy, uh, and that's what gives you um, those fractions. Uh, if that makes sense, so that so you know baked into that, you have to make some assumptions for like how often do you think neutron stars explode uh, in galaxies, which is uh, for neutron stars is actually still somewhat uncertain. So exactly you know what that fraction is, if it's like forty percent or fifty percent for uh, different processes, uh, uh, still an active area of research. And also baked into that a bit is, um, you know, again, the properties of the galaxy itself. So if I were to, you know, if I knew, if I knew, if I knew everything about the universe and I were to make that table for our Milky Way versus uh, a low mass dwarf galaxy, the exact fractions will be very different. And that's just because the evolutionary history of that galaxy and sort of how many neutron stars versus other things that have happened to the galaxy will be different and based off the properties of that galaxy. Awesome. Okay. Well, I like this question that was just asked. How does a binary neutron star system form? So we were, you know, there's been, Ilaria was talking about neutron stars and binary neutron stars, you know, Andrew was addressing, but um, 
Sarah, you you uh, you want to chime in on this one? Yes, this is a good uh, question to prepare for my qualifying exam coming up. So I will take this. Um, so there are a couple of different theories for how uh, binary neutron stars can form. And in reality, in it probably is a combination of uh, many of these different effects, depending on the system that you're looking at. Uh, so one way that you can get binary neutron stars is just binary stellar evolution. So you form a binary star. Uh, we have two stars that just form on the main sequence. They form the way that uh, normal stars do. Many, many stars form in binaries. Um, and then they just evolve separately and they both end up as neutron stars. Uh, so this, uh, uh, compared to other types of binary stars, uh, binary neutron stars are more rare. Like uh, we much more often get low mass stars as we talked about earlier in the session. Uh, M dwarfs are the most common types of stars or red dwarf stars. Uh, so to get two stars that are both massive enough to evolve into neutron stars is pretty rare. Um, another way that you could get binary neutron stars is by dynamical capture. So the idea behind that is that you have two neutron stars that are just speeding by each other in the galaxy and they approach each other close enough that they capture into the system together. Um, this is also probably pretty rare because uh, it doesn't happen very often where you have two stars that get close enough to each other that they uh, capture each other. So this probably only happens in very dense stellar environments so where there's a lot of stars anyway. Um, yeah, and because I'm a planet person, I'll also mention that we have detected planets, exoplanets around uh, pulsars, which are a type of neutron star. So you could like stretch and call that a binary <laughs> neutron star system where one of the components of the binary is a neutron star. Um, and we have no idea how those form. Uh, it's unclear if the planets in those systems like survived the um, star becoming a neutron star or if they formed uh, after the neutron star was formed, so after the star uh, uh, became a neutron star. I think you're muted, Cameron. <laughs> Sitting here yapping at my computer. Um, yeah, so wasn't that the first exoplanet that was discovered was around the neutron star? Yeah, yep. it depends what you, <laughs> depends how you classify the first exoplanet. Some people only classify uh, like, planets that orbit uh, like solar type stars is, oh, is actual It'd exoplanets. Political as to who gets to claim the first exoplanet. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's also worth, worth mentioning that, you know, other than, you know, massive stars being, you know, in general more rare as uh, our audience is really new because they know that the red dwarfs are the more common ones. Um, there is another problem in forming binary neutron stars that, you know, to form a neutron star, you need a supernova. And so if you have two stars orbiting each other and one of them goes supernova, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a big explosion. So you need, <laughs> you need to have the binary system survive that explosion and then survive the other explosion, <laughs> so because both of them are neutron stars, so that it's a very tricky thing to do, um, and that's why they're not super common. And it's still, you know, they exist. We have seen binary neutron stars, so there must be they might they, they have to survive both uh, explosions, but it's it's tough. <laughs> so presumably during the supernova explosion the ejecta from one of the, the star that's turning into a supernova would be so energetic that it would, uh, could, depending on the proximity to the other star, just like obliterate it or wipe off the top layers of it or disrupt it entirely. Yeah, just kick the other one off, right? Or go ping. Yeah, yeah so like the, the easiest thing to do is that when you have like such a huge explosion, it's just like the other one gets kicked out. Right, so that it, it's very easy to do. Like, you know, if you can imagine like you have an explosion, all this material get blown off and you just get this, this kick on the other one and it just disrupt the, uh, the system. No so it really of, depends uh, what, what the system was like before. Right, that, okay. Uh, so related to this, could there be fragments of exploded neutron stars in the core of our sun or the core of any of the planets? 
since we're talking about neutron stars. I mean, we don't really understand what's going on. I mean, as Olari already discussed with the quark soup and the you know, uh, equation of state for neutron stars, we don't really know what's going on in the, in the interiors of those. So, but I guess the, based on what Andrew was talking about, binary neutron star mergers create additional elements like some of the precious metals that, that he mentioned. And those, and it may actually be one of the main sources for those. So those could be, so those obviously like silver and gold, we see them on the earth. I mean, I don't have any, but we see them on the earth. And so, and we know that those are primarily forming. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess those are, you can call them fragments of neutron yeah, stars, like, I guess. Not like, <laughs> not like a big chunk that was in the middle of the neutron star and is now here. It's more that like that, that chunk. You won't get the quartz. <laughs> you don't get the quartz, right. The conditions are not right for just quarks hanging out around here. Okay. Well, and I guess, can... you know, the core of the neutron star will not, you know, in the explosion, the core of the neutron star will stay there. Like what's ejected and what reaches us, like the silver and the gold, is really made, like it's like just part of like the exterior of the neutron star, like the cores of both neutron star will just like collapse. The crust. the crust. Yeah. And also like if quirks, you know, if you, even if they were flying around, they would just recombine very quickly into yeah. a proton and a neutron, so you would just get a proton. Got it. Sarah, you wanted to add something? I forgot. Oh, okay. matter. It's not important. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just didn't know. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> uh, let's see. What since we're since we're rolling with compact uh, objects, what is the Chandra Shekhar limit, and how does it factor into element formation? So the I don't know who wants to. I think we can all at some level field this. Who wants to roll with this? Andrew, you haven't spoken for a while. All right, Tell so, us about trying to shake our limit. Yeah, so this is the uh, the mass limit about white dwarfs that I didn't name uh, during the talk. Uh, uh, beyond which, uh, they, so, it, so it's the critical mass beyond which uh, nuclear reactions can start occurring in the white dwarf. Uh, and you know what makes this an interesting limit is that it's 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 a pretty catastrophic limit. So once you surpass this, the white dwarf. Uh, all of the white dwarf sort of uh, begins to have nuclear reactions and the whole thing sort of at once explodes, uh, leaving nothing behind. Um, so, so this is really that mass special beyond which the white dwarf begins to synthesize uh, new elements and no longer exist. Okay, good. Well done, well done. Oh, and I forgot to say, Sarah, you had such an excellent response about the binary neutron star merger. You pass your poll. You, you, you're, uh, <laughs> No, I don't have Great. the power to do that. I am not a. I'm what, not a Cameron? <laughs> I wish. I wish I did. You but I think so. you're, I, you're well, well sorted. So you'll you'll do excellent on your qualifying. Thank qualified. you. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, here's a a, a, an, a sort of different kind of question. How has the pandemic affected the NASA astronaut application process? So what's being referenced here is. Every few years, NASA requests applications for people who are potentially interested in being an astronaut. It used to be in the 80s when we had the shuttle going up like every other month that these astronaut applications happened quite frequently, sometimes as frequently as multiple times per year because they were really trying to get a, a, a large core of astronauts. But more recently with the, with the retirement of the shuttle program, you know, a decade ago, there's been fewer opportunities for astronauts to go into space. But they're trying to ramp that up again in anticipation of the new artists, Artemis missions that NASA is running uh, to go back into to have manned space flight and and not be so reliant on going through through the Russians and the Soyuz capsules. So there was a request for applications that occurred in the spring, I think it was February, March, the deadline was the end of March. I applied, there were other members of the department applied. Did uh, did any of you guys apply? No? Oh, you don't wanna go to space? 
Oh, who doesn't want to go to space? It wasn't a question of want. <laughs> well, scary. Scary. Yeah, well, it's too I, scary. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I don't know. Well, anyway, there are a number of members of the department who applied. Generally, with the astronaut application process, there are a lot of applicants, and it's, you have a very low chance of getting to be to go to space. There, I think this time around, there were 12 or 15,000 applicants, and they will choose on the order of 10 people in the end. The process usually takes about a year, a year and a half, because they do a number of cuts. Initially, it's a triage where they look through everyone's application and it reduce it down to about 500 people that they check those people's references. And then from there, uh, then they, they make a further cut down to 100, 120 people that they actually invite to come to Johnson Space Center and you know do tests and interviews and physical fitness checks and all these things. Make sure you're not a cyborg or whatever. And then that, that they need to be very fit as well. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you you need to be healthy. They the, need to make the, sure. Cameron, the uh, ultra marathon runner. Well, I yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying, you were, you know you were asking us. I was like, oh well, I don't think I would ever be. <laughs> no, but you, I don't think the the physical fitness requirements are that high. Uh, I think I think generally you need to be healthy. They want to make sure that you're not going to kick the bucket five years after you're made into an astronaut, right? They want to make sure that they're putting a good investment in. Um, and, and they generally, the two tracks that people take towards being an astronaut are either you're a super amazing pilot who can pilot the craft. This is how you pilot, by the way, like this. pilot the craft into space or, and or you're a scientist with a lot of uh, background in science, engineering, that sort of thing, problem solving for conducting experiments in space or, or dealing with problems that might come up in space. And of course, other, other things fall into this, whether it's medical training, but the, the main thing is that people, people are highly sought after for not freaking out when conditions go south and and they refer to it as being what is it being operative like being able to deal with stress and not freaking out because you might have to do that and not die and crash your spaceship into the mars or whatever so uh anyway i'm getting off track the point is the question was about if the pandemic affected the time scales officially no the pandemic they are claiming that it will go forward on the normal original schedule of when they would be reviewing and potentially selecting astronaut candidates. But I, to my knowledge, they have not reached the first cut from the original number of applicants down to 500 or so. But I, I think that was meant to happen sometime late summer anyway. So I, I don't think they're behind schedule officially. I imagine, I imagine people will start hearing if they made the, well, you don't officially hear, it's just that your references get contacted and then you know, oh, I still am in the top, you know, 500 or so, but who knows? We'll see. I'll Good let luck. you know if I, if I make that far, but. I'd love for your camera. Anyway, uh, let's get back to science. Science, science, science. How about this question related to our quark soup? What is a strange star? Alaria, perhaps you can uh, you can address this one. Sure, uh, that's that's again related to what I was saying about you know a neutron star being extremely dense. Um, so there is the possibility, and some people um, you know have pushed the theory forward and still looking for you know uh, observational evidence for it that you know when you turn some matter into quark, like, you know, at the core of the neutron star, you get so dense that some matter actually, you know, you liberate the quarks. And what then happen, when that happens, there is a possibility, then somehow, like, it's, it, you know, it becomes, the entire matter becomes unstable. And so the entire star becomes just three quarks. 
it just that's that's what a strange star is. It's this, it's a new you know the idea of uh, that maybe some neutron stars or maybe all neutron stars instead of being made of neutrons and protons and you know the way we think of like the normal matter that is around us it's just all quirks and and even other in other particles that usually don't appear in, in normal matter like pions and other weird particles so that's that's the idea is that the post there's the possibility it's very theoretical uh, it hasn't been seen that you know because we cannot reach those densities here on earth so if you imagine you know an atom you know, you know, you show the pictures of the atom in, in Andrew's talk, right? The carbon atom. Like in reality, the nucleus of the atom is like like very, very small. Like if you take the atom to be a sport field, the nucleus is like the ball, right? And so while in neutron stars, all the atoms, instead of having like one field, two fields, three fields, etc., you have them all squished together so that all the balls are <laughs> actually touching each other. So that's how then it gets and actually they merge. So at the center of the neutron star, you don't have the balls, you just have all of them merged together as protons and neutrons and even maybe as quarks. Uh, so we cannot reach that on earth in any laboratory. So it's all very theoretical, but there is the possibility that some stars are just actually made all of quarks, like free quarks. So that's a strange star. Okay. So a strange star is like a big quirky it's all quarks. Yes. Okay. 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 And you know, this you could have like a, a you know, if you could have a, a crust of normal matter or not, like there's the different possibilities. There's the quark that is just like a naked strange star, and then there's like the strange star with a crust, or a strange star that has only the nucleus of it is quarks. It's it, you can have all the possibilities in theory land. <laughs> <laughs> theory um, then, then we, we love to figure out what they actually made of in right. reality uh, a question i think for Ilaria and andrew both if only elements up to iron are actually created by nuclear fusion inside massive stars how do we get elements like strontium in exploding white dwarfs like elements that are more massive than than iron I think this this question could go well with the other question that I see someone made about the R process and oh yeah the process. R process I'll I'll ask that one as well so we can kind of uh, let's see what's the difference between the R process and the S process are heavier elements more likely to come from the R process and I think I've been talking too much so Andrew you can <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you um, okay so so it's not that. Um, I guess, okay, to answer the first question. So in, in massive stars, uh, uh, elements are synthesized all the way up to iron. Uh, and it stops at iron just because um, up to that point, uh, the nuclear reactions that occurred uh, release energy. So they're sort of what's called energetically favorable. Uh, but after that point, it, it gets challenging to, to have, um, to fuse elements together to get heavier elements. And so beyond that point, it takes quite a lot of energy to fuse those elements together. And so it's not that it's not possible to to like to make um, to have nuclear fusion happen to make more elements heavier than iron. It's just that the conditions aren't right uh, in massive stars in their cores. Um, but this can happen in exploding white dwarfs, for example, uh, just because you know the process of that sort of uh, uh, chain reaction where the entire star sort of explodes all at once uh, uh, generates the right conditions where you have enough energy uh, to fuse heavier elements than iron. Um, which actually, I, I don't quite know if it's that is, yes, it is. Okay. Which is a separate process, um, from what's called the S and the R process, um, which is asked, uh, also. And so the S process and the R process are, uh, two different ways to make even heavier elements. And so these are, uh, the stuff that were colored with the, the yellow and the orange, so stuff made, uh, in, in low mass dying, low mass stars and the stuff made in merging neutron stars. And the S and the R uh, is short for slow and rapid. Uh, and what happens in this process is uh, you have the right conditions where there's a large number of neutrons flying around. 
Um, and it's sort of obvious that this would maybe happen in an exploding neutron star because it is made entirely of neutrons. Um, and those that sort of large amount or large flux of neutrons flying around uh, collides with uh, an element uh, and sort of adds neutrons and neutrons to that element. So it makes it to a higher isotope uh, of the same element. Uh, and then that element decays uh, and it decays such that it sort of uh, uh, changes one of those neutrons into a proton. So it becomes a heavier element. And this process occurs repeatedly uh, sort of like cascading upward the periodic table almost. And this S and the R again refer to slow and rapid. So the slow is that this process happens slowly uh, relative to how fast it takes for those elements to decay. And so that produces a certain set of elements. Uh, and then the rapid is, the is you know, this happens much faster. And so that allows you to, to make a certain a different set of elements. I see. So the just for clarification, the S and the R, slow and rapid, is just how much it's getting, how frequently it's getting hit by neutrons. Yeah, yeah, relative to how, how fast it takes uh, for the element to decay. And so if it's slow relative to how fast the element decays, it's the slow process. If it's fast, it's the rapid. And the decay half-lives for some of these isotopes and elements are? Uh, they're quick. I don't know exactly. How Less fast. than a million years. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I would assume they're in like the seconds range. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Even less, yes. Yeah, we're smaller. Yeah. Okay. Million years. That's kind of the time scale. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to think of all these like atoms floating around and there's neutrons bumping into them. And like if, if you know, if the atoms, you know, catch the nucleus and, and then, you know, if maybe if it, if in the same time, you know, it's, it catches another nucleus. That those things are happen very fast. Like you think about a neutron star explosion. So and you have to think as you know, you have many, many, many of these processes going on, and at the same time, you know, some of them are still having the time to um, um, decay. Right? Mm -hmm. These are like quick processes. They're not like millions of years kind right. of processes. Okay. Okay. Supernova explosion. Cool. Another. Uh... Oh, I like this question. A combination between elements and exoplanets. Can we find what elements exoplanets are made of? Tell us, Sarah. Teach us the ways. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so yes, we can to in several different ways and to varying extents. <laughs> um, so the most direct way that we can find what exoplanets are made of is by taking spectra of their atmospheres. Uh, so this is just looking for uh, the signatures of different elements or molecules in uh, the atmospheres of an exoplanet. So you can do this with either transmission spectroscopy or with direct imaging. So transmission spectroscopy works by, uh, you can only do this for transiting planets. So you can only do it for planets that pass between your line of sight and the star that you're looking at. Um, but when the planet uh, passes over the surface of the star, um, you see a transit. So you see a slight dip in the amount of light that is uh, emitted by the star because the planet casts a shadow on the star. And essentially, if you look at this, uh, the depth of this shadow, the amount of light that's blocked in various different wavelengths uh, and different colors of light, you'll notice that uh, the amount of light that's blocked is actually different. So the, uh, the size of the shadow appears larger at some colors than others. And if you do this uh, at a wide range of colors or wavelengths, you can construct the spectrum of the, uh, uh, of the planet. And that's because uh, this planet actually appears larger at uh, certain wavelengths than it does at other wavelengths because the atmosphere is blocking the light at those wavelengths. Uh, so that's transmission spectroscopy. Uh, you can also, as I said, directly image the planet. So separate out the light of the planet from the light from its host star. We can only do this for the most massive planets that are very far away from their stars because uh, they basically need to be disentangled from the light of the primary star. Uh, but when we do this, one of the great advantages of doing this is that you can directly measure the, the uh, planet spectrum. So you don't need to measure how much uh, the size of the shadow changes as the planet transits over the surface of the star, you can just directly measure the spectrum of the planet. 
Um, and we've used uh, direct imaging spectroscopy to measure uh, elements like methane in the atmospheres of very giant planets. Uh, so that was very exciting. Uh, we've also measured water vapor in those in some of those atmospheres. Uh, this does not mean they're habitable. They're certainly not. <laughs> um, but we do see water vapor in some of those atmospheres. Um, and one other thing that we can do to determine a planet's uh, what a planet is made of is look at its bulk composition. So the way that you do that is you measure the radius of the planet and the mass of the planet. We can get the radius from the transit method that I was talking about earlier. So looking for how much light the planet blocks when it uh, transits in front of the star. And you can get the mass of the planet by something called the radial velocity effect, um, the radial velocity method which detects the gravitational tug of the planet on the star. Um, so if you combine mass and mass measured by the radial velocity method and, uh, and radius measured by the transit method, you get a density. So that doesn't necessarily tell you, you know, this planet is this percent rock and this percent uh, water and this percent atmosphere. Um, but it can tell you overall uh, what type of composition the planet is consistent with. So one of the big surprises from these sorts of analyses is that actually the dominant type of planet that we detect in our galaxy does not exist in the solar system. So what we see most often in the galaxy are super Earths and mini Neptunes. So super Earths are large rocky planets and mini Neptunes are miniature Neptunes. Um, they have rocky cores and hydrogen and helium envelopes. So they have atmospheres that are primarily hydrogen and helium. So that composition of mini Neptunes is totally different from anything we see in our solar system. That was one of the big surprises. Huh, that's interesting. So that, but their densities or their average densities, you'd find a very different average density for a super earth because it's a big rocky, Ball exactly. Then you yeah. would for this mini Neptune, which is more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's how you can tell the difference between them, basically, um, because uh, super Earths have densities that are consistent with Earth, bulk densities that are consistent with that of Earth, uh, and mini Neptunes don't. They're a lot less dense because they have a lot of this puffy material. Got it. Hmm. All right, we only have about less than 15 minutes left. There are a couple questions that I really want to get to here. Let's do this, this one that's kind of for all of us. Could you guys brief, briefly talk about your journey so far in the field of astronomy, astrophysics? What would your advice be to someone wanting to take up astronomy and astrophysics? So I think we can all at some level speak to this based on our own experiences. Um, uh, who, who wants to start? Ilaria, lay it on us. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a broad question. <laughs> uh, um, uh, mine is a bit weird because I want to do philosophy and then uh, I realized I you know to really understand like the questions that really uh, interested me were like, what is time? Uh, what is space? Where do we come from? And then I'm like, ah, maybe today the better way to probe these questions is really go into physics. Uh, so that's that's what I did. And so I went to physics and then astronomy kind of came uh, like like on the way. Um, so that's 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 my journey. I, I started from a little town in Italy and now I'm at Caltech. It's been it's been quite quite uh, the trip. Uh, <laughs> so to um to uh, my recommendations I have B, oh no. You muted for a second, but now you're back. You Sorry, my, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> my thing just did. You keep muting. No, it's just my, my, my thing's disconnected. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so lots of, if you really want lots of uh, uh, um, advice, please email me. In general, like be informed, be aware of like what's like. Of course, 
always question is this the thing that I really like to do am I passionate about what I'm doing that's the most important part because if you're not it's a very uh, hard and demanding job and it what really keep us all going is really that we really love it so keep asking yourself that question all the time and um Yes, just keep being aware of like your your colleagues and everyone around you and and your when you're a student of your friends and and just like go look out for opportunities. That's 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 my suggestion because there are a lot, but you need to be uh, open for them. Andrew, do you want to chime in next? Sure. Yeah. I uh, so I was I, I guess always interested in I, don't know, I was one of those kids who thought space is cool i'm sure most people do i don't know i don't i don't know who would think that stars and exploding things aren't aren't cool well they're not watching this this season. well yeah that's certainly that's certainly true or maybe they are i don't know anyway um so but i i didn't really know what i wanted to do going into undergrad uh i thought i was good at math so i would should do something that uses math and i tried engineering and i decided very quickly that i didn't enjoy it uh and so i I, I figured, you know, if I was, you know, because reading books about space um, and physics just kind of for fun uh, at the time, and I decided uh, I should try and see what it might be like to actually uh, have a career in astronomy or physics. And so as an undergrad, I, I started doing research. Um, I emailed the professor. He happened to have something for me to work on. And then I kind of just fell in love uh, with, you know, both, both the topic of, of, of astronomy and also just the actual doing the research um, and that's sort of what got me here today. Uh, so I went to grad school after that and, and I'm here. Um, so I guess, you know, specific advice, I think depends on, uh, you know, exactly where you are and, and how, you know, how deep you want to go into this, right? If you just want to know more about astronomy and learn more, um, uh, you know, I've, I'll, I have a certain, I have some things I can, some advice I can give if you want to, you know, go into astronomy as like a career, if you want to do research, I have a different set of advice I can give. So. You know, for more detailed stuff, you, you know, anyone can can reach out and email me. I think my email is on my website somewhere. If not, it shouldn't be too hard to find. Um, and yeah, just for reference, in the description for this YouTube event, it has a, a brief bio for each of us, and it has a link to our website, so you can you can check out more. But uh, Sarah, how would you like to respond to the sure. question? Sure. Thanks. Um. So I. Uh, I also sort of similarly always really liked math, but I never really knew what you could use math for. Um, and I took a physics class my senior year of under of, of, of neither undergrad nor college, but high school. Um, and I really loved it. Uh, I liked uh, being able to apply math to understand the world. So I decided I wanted to be a physicist, but I had no idea what it meant to be a physicist and know people that were physicists. Um, so I took a year off before going to college to see if I could figure that out and work <laughs> at the same time. Um, so I uh, got a job and then separately I, I started volunteering at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, and uh, initially I was volunteering in the paleontology department cleaning dinosaur bones which sounds a lot cooler than it actually was. It was super boring. Um, and also uh, working as a TA in the after school uh, education program. And I had an awesome mentor in the uh, education program who was in charge of the program. Um, and she was an astronomy major in undergrad. And she, she knew that I was interested in physics and she started taking me to these uh, weekly brown bag lunches that they have there where the astronomy people and the and the astronomy department folks talk about their research. Um, and I thought it was so cool. I didn't understand anything they were talking about, but I loved going to the lectures. Um, and uh, one day, one of the lectures was given by Emily Rice, who was also the first woman that I ever saw give a lecture about astronomy. I thought she was the coolest thing ever. And I emailed her like once a week for like the next six weeks or something like that, asking if I could like you know, do data entry for her or something. And then finally she let me uh, come on board and do data entry for her. And yeah, I literally started, I did data entry um, and uh, postdoc took pity on me and taught me Python and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. 
for reference as well to our audience, Emily Rice is one of the main people in charge of Astronomy on Tap globally. Uh, I referenced it before. So yeah, she's she's great. She's great. Emily's amazing. Yeah. And in fact, we're going to have a uh, Museum of Natural History member, Jackie Faherty, whom you may have met. She's going to give our Astronomy on Tap in the next, probably in two months. So yeah, Sweet. she's awesome too. Cool. Uh, that's that's very heartfelt response. I, I like that. Um, yeah, my path is, I've always enjoyed science and I was actually a computer science major as an undergraduate, but turned towards the computational astrophysics side of things towards the end of my, my degree. And I don't know, I, I'm not really about making a lot of money. I'm more about, I, I think, I think science and doing science well, you can't really be about making money and going into academic science. But uh, I think science and the pursuit of basic research like science is nominally like one of the best things that we can that we can do, like in terms of helping humans to better understand the natural world around them, just for the sake of understanding is just, I think, a really noble pursuit. So I've I've kind of stayed on that path since since college but originally i was i was set to do computer science which is also science but it's applied science i suppose as opposed to astrophysics or physics or or some of the more physics physical sciences um, and in terms of suggestions that i'd have for people wanting to get more involved obviously this is a super broad question for children wanting to get more involved and, and, and stay on that path, uh, I would say study hard in your math and science courses, try and read outside, continue to watch our lecture series. Maybe you'll, you'll you know, become further motivated to pursue this. But then, yeah, once you get towards uh, college level, ask yourself, as Ilaria suggested, ask yourself, is this, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about this, but am I really excited, like willing to go through the whole slog of, of going to graduate school? Because it is, you have to really be self-motivated. Uh, if you aren't, you're not going to make it through. It's a lot of work. But I think the rewards are pretty substantial. And, and yeah, you get to talk about science all the time, think about science all the time, get paid to do it, which is pretty sweet. So you anyway. studied your physics courses, even if you're in astronomy. That's very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and, and math, for that matter. And math, Computer yes. science and statistics. Computer science, yeah. Computer science is, in any physical science, being able to code is basically a necessity. Uh, pretty much everything you're going to be doing is going to be related to computers in some capacity. So having the ability to code, I think, is just a requirement for anyone pursuing any kind of science these days. I forgot to give a piece of advice. Can I give a piece of advice? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so my one piece of advice for people interested in uh, going into astronomy is not to believe the genius narrative, um, that you have to be a genius in order to do astronomy or physics. Totally not true. Um, and the most important thing that you need is uh, willingness to work hard and grit. Um, so. Yeah, don't let them tell you you need to be brilliant on that. Well, I I think you're great. I I still think you're 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 on the qual path. So thanks. That's all I need. I just need to pass my qual. <laughs> I don't need to be brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, we're we're a couple minutes before we'll we'll host one last question uh, that just came up. If most systems have planets, have we ever tried to estimate the total mass? that all these exoplanets might represent in the universe and subtract it from the missing mass of dark matter. Um, and then there's a couple of add-ons in terms of rogue planets, uh, so on and so forth. But um, people have done this when they try and put together the, the mass budget of baryons versus dark matter. There were a number of studies that were done. I mean, people try and add up all of the forms of baryonic matter, normal matter, protons, electrons, neutrons, and so on and so forth. 
to see if that comes close to being able to represent what we think is missing, the missing mass, which is nominally dark matter. And, and it's not even close. You know, you can add up, make estimates on the number of black holes that are present, both supermassive black holes in the interiors of galaxies, as well as just kind of rogue stellar black holes, stellar mass black holes flying around. Planets, sure. Uh, there was, there's a big project about 20-ish years ago, people thought that the dominant form of dark matter might be something called machos, massive, massive is for M and A in macho, massive compact halo objects, which is to say either small dark, uh, small black holes or planets or something just kind of flying around in the void of space in the galactic halo. So kind of the, the outskirts of the galaxy, kind of like up here. Um, and, and propose that that was the, that was dark matter. That was kind of the missing mass. And a number of studies were done to look for the gravitational signal of these. So you stare at a, at a star field, much like the Kepler Space Telescope is doing, looking for exoplanets that are transiting in front of their, their stars. This was just looking, oh, it's, it's too bad we don't have Kalen on here tonight, our normal astronomy on tap host, because he does a lot, he's, he's a big proponent of um, microlensing studies. But you look at a big star field, and then you look at the brightening and dimming of those stars, because occasionally, if there are a lot of massive, massive compact halo objects, like these, these little planets running around or black holes running around, they'll pass in between us and the background stars and gravitationally lens those stars. And when they lens them, it's like passing a magnifying glass in front of, I wish I had a magnifying glass, passing it in front of us between the mirror and us. And you'll see as it passes directly in between you and some bright star in the background, for a period that will get really, really bright as, the magne as it's magnified. And then it'll, it'll go down again in terms of its luminosity. And so, that gives you a really good constraint on the, the number of these objects, kind of these unseen objects kind of floating around in space. And we just don't see that many. Uh, we just don't see many microlensing events to suggest that there are a lot of these massive compact halo objects. So yeah, unfortunately, we have to rely on this idea of dark matter, this non-baryonic dark matter, which, you know, we as scientists don't really like to invoke some sort of crazy, weird stuff out there to explain our problems with, with cosmology and with gravitation. But unfortunately, all the, all the evidence seems to point towards that. So I know that's frustrating. And we're most frustrated of all. We don't want to just say, oh, yeah, it's some magic thing that you can't see. That's what's making up the bulk of the universe. But if the shoe fits, that's what it looks like. So um, do, do you guys want to add in? I kind of yapped on that one. Do you guys want to add anything to, to that? No? I like if the shoe fits, it's dark matter. You what? The shoe, that's right. the shoe fits, it's dark matter. Um, OK, everybody. Well, thank you very much for sticking around. We have 75 people who made it all the way to the end of our, of our panel. I will. Um, I'll update uh, our description to have the questions and the timestamps associated with each question that's asked. So you can flick through the description and see your favorite question answered. Um, but thank you very much, Andrew, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you panelists. I think this is really a fun discussion. And thank you audience members for, for joining us. Uh, our next event, Astronomy on Tap, a week from Monday, at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. And go check out the Perseids if you have access to a dark sky site next week. Should be good. Um, I've included a link in the description that gives you information on like where to look in the sky in case my, my glamming over uh, where, the, where Perseus was in the sky and just general information about the Perseid meteor shower. And our next lecture will be in about a month. I'll post it on our website. I'll post it on YouTube. I'll post it on social media. So should be good. Uh, thanks, everybody.
have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Cameron. Bye. Thank you. Okay.